Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to X Camera. So thank you very much for attending this afternoon's X Camera talk by Kathy Cranius. The Artistic Director of InterArts Matrix, Sheila McMath, has curated this virtual speaker series and will introduce Kathy more fully in one moment. But first, I would like to welcome you and let you know a bit about the X Camera series. So from the spring of 2019 to March of 2020, a group of people interested in the arts gathered at Fresh Ground Cafe slash Common Studio in downtown Kitchener every Friday afternoon to hear a lecture by an interdisciplinary artist or professional. The lectures were followed by a question and answer period, and then folks stayed in the cafe space had lunch, continued conversations, and built a community. So it's in the spirit of supporting artists and building community that we have relaunched X Camera virtually on Zoom, and the series will continue on Fridays at one for the foreseeable future. So the talk will start soon, and Kathy will speak until about 10 to two. So please feel free to type questions in the Zoom chat function as the lecture happens. And after the lecture, we'll have a question and answer period that's focused on Kathy's work. And just after two, following the Q&A, we'll open up the room. So we welcome you to stay on Zoom for a half an hour to introduce yourselves, meet others from the art community, and perhaps even have discussions about potential future collaborations. So we're very pleased to have Kathy with us, with us here this afternoon. Um, and first, we'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis peoples. We recognize the significance of the Dish with One Spoon Covenant to this land. The Dish with One Spoon Covenant is a peace agreement made between Indigenous nations before the Europeans arrived. It characterizes our collective responsibility to each other and to the earth that we should only take what we need, leave enough for others, and keep the dish clean. Today, this gathering places home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and acknowledging them reminds us of our important connection to this land where we live, work, and learn. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome Kathy Cranius here this afternoon. Kathy is a multidisciplinary artist who engages with sculpture, dance, video, and writing. Her work has been presented in solo exhibitions at David K. Gallery in Toronto and the Art Gallery of uh, Peterborough. She's also participated in group exhibitions at A.K. Collins Gallery in Peterborough, SOFA Art Expo in Chicago, and the Gardner Museum of Art. Uh, her practice has received uh, support through graduate scholarships at York University, as well as grants from Canada Council for the Arts and the Ontario Arts Council. Her work has also received attention and acclaim in publications including The Globe and Mail, Galleries West, Ceramic Art and Perception, and Studio Magazine. And uh, more recently, Kathy has been invited to give lectures at venues across Canada including at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, OCAD University, Sheridan College, and at the Conference of the Canadian Women's Art History Initi Initiative. Um, on a personal note, I was introduced to Kathy's work about 10 years ago, and I've watched her career with interest since that time. In her practice, Kathy explores themes that remain relevant and meaningful to me, uh, namely her interest in mythology, female subjectivity and agency, her interest in gesture, the tactile and the meaning of labor, and her exploration of the healing power of art for both the maker and the viewer or the participant. So it's also worth noting uh, that Kathy Cranius is a generous member of the arts community, a friendly face at art openings and a person who genuinely takes interest in the work of her artistic colleagues. Whenever I've had the opportunity to talk to Kathy at an opening, she always has another artist or artists close by. Um, and she's always inter interested in introducing um, the work of people that she admires and that she's excited about. So um, that's just a, a unique quality that Kathy has, I think. So this collegial and collaborative spirit is integral to how she operates as a person. And I suspect critical in the development of this new uh, interdisciplinary work, an interdisciplinary body of work that will be the focus of today's talk. So 
Um, I've heard Kathy talk in bits and pieces about her work, but I've never heard a comprehensive lecture. So um, it'll be a pleasure for me to hear her speak today and I'm sure a pleasure for all of us. So I will thank our sponsors for X Camera, uh, Ontario Arts Council, City of Waterloo, City of Kitchener and the City of Cambridge. And um, just before I turn it over to Kathy, um, I wanted to say that uh, I know that Hannah did a land acknowledgement that was specific, that is specific to InterArts Matrix. But I know that there are people attending from across Canada, from other places. Uh, so if you would like to include a land acknowledgement in the chat as we get started with the lecture, um, it would be nice to see uh, where people are attending from and, and to give that land acknowledgement for other places. So um, again, it's a pleasure to have you here, Kathy. Thanks so much. And I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Sheila. That was a very generous introduction. Um, I wanted to also thank Inter, uh, Sheila InterArts Matrix and the local, provincial and national government funders. I'm really grateful to have this special opportunity hosted by uh, X Camera series platform to speak about uh, this new interdisciplinary project in progress. I'm currently calling it Touching Form Movement and the Haptic. Uh, this experimental project is in progress. It's not yet completed. And currently I am combining uh, my sculptures, my recent sculptures, dance and video to explore nonverbal expressions of empathy and of play through movement. The project is absolutely a response to the inertia and constraints of the COVID-19 crisis. And I'm actually choreographing my own physical gestures with my clay sculptures that I've recently made, focusing on sensuously animating their forms, their lines, their textures, and their movements. In this talk, I'm going to show you some raw video clips and explain the process I'm using. Um, I'll also talk about and show you the sources that led me to work in an interdisciplinary way for this. And I will talk about how my project addresses materiality and the universal and metaphorical language of ceramics uh, by engaging discourses of healing, feminism, and craft. So I'm going to start with uh, two, showing you two very, very short uh, raw video clips, which is the footage I'm using uh, for the project. So we'll just start by looking at those um, before I say anything more. So here's our first one. And I will show you a second one. There are many, but I'll show you two. <laughs> So I'm employing these clay sculptures, among other ones, um, from my wing series, which I made beginning in 2019 um, until uh, very recently, um, along with engaging my own movements and choreographic skills. So I'm using my own body, my own sculptures, tripods, a video camera set up with both natural lighting and I'm experimenting, of course, with also um, spotlights. Uh, with these numerous video clips, such as the two that I just showed you. I turn the sculptures on a banding wheel, which is a piece of ceramic equipment that I use for decorating and building uh, my sculptures with clay. And I develop the choreography of my movements through improvisation. 
And improvisation is a really, really important aspect of the process of making this. So I'm aiming for a five minute long video and the video clips I, I will be using, as you've seen, just these ones range from about 15 seconds to 45 seconds long. Uh, she's not here today, unfortunately, she could not be here, but I've engaged uh, film and video editor, Catherine Assals, who's well known for her editing work, uh, particularly in documentary film work. Uh, she's a former colleague whom I collaborated with a very long time ago, I will say 35 years ago. Uh, on a public mural project um, in the mid 80s while we were both students at Concordia University um, uh, in Montreal. Another collaborator is artist and photographer Marina Dempster, um, who's collaborating in a, a wonderful way, specifically with the uh, still shots she has done, which you'll be seeing shortly. Um, and she actually has been documenting my, my sculptures since 2010. So she's another um, important person who's part of the circle of this project. Um, currently, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm in the very early stages um, of the project. And um, I'm really focusing just on my hand gestures in a, in a relational way with what I've made, the sculptures. I'm playing a lot with different rhythms of my hands, touching, caressing, tracing, and echoing uh, the forms with different movement qualities. Quick, abrupt movements and long, languid, undulating and flowing movements. And in doing this, I intend to evoke metaphors of landscape and the body. Um, I'm going to show you a short, a very short <laughs> dance I choreographed in relation to water, where I move on a rock above the water. This is an important place to me. It's a lake where I grew up, uh, spending my summers. Uh, the title of the piece is Water Dance. And making this video has been important to the process of the larger video project as I think about my movement in relation to a thing in this case, water. So I'm just gonna play this briefly. And so I have a dance and choreography background the idea, though, of uh, performing solely with my body movements is something I began to think about in conversation with my colleague, um, art historian, art critic and curator and editor, Lara Katsuba in uh, 2019. I believe she's here today. Um, and this was immediately before the COVID-19 crisis. And we were discussing exhibition ideas for the sculptures I was in the process of making. Uh, working in isolation during lockdown actually did allow these ideas to gel in my mind, um, in my work. And I chose video as a platform because I could work on it and present my ideas digitally rather than rely on an exhibition space or a stage to perform. I do have a history in dance from the 70s, 80s and 90s. I studied ballet in Toronto as a child and as a young adult, I studied modern dance at the professional training program of the Toronto Dance Theater uh, with choreographers Patricia Beatty, David Earl, and Christopher House. And Patricia Beatty probably doesn't remember me, but her, her improvisation classes were just astoundingly brilliant. <laughs> I certainly benefited from those. Uh, later, as a visual arts and drama teacher in the 90s, I coached dance clubs, created choreography, and rehearsed students for high school musical theatre productions with the Toronto District School Board, where I was employed for eight years. I also studied West African dance with the Senegalese community in Toronto in the late 80s, and I'm currently studying hip-hop, which I just love, with Mike Relentless in Toronto. He's an Afro-Caribbean dancer and uh, choreographer. So my project, as I started initially, was precipitated by the COVID-19 crisis, where specifically in Toronto, we were really one of the most locked down cities in North America. 
And it was a tremendously long period of inertia uh, for, for ev everybody and myself. Uh, my clay studio is at home, uh, fortunately. <laughs> um, so I was able to work daily and hand build my sculptures. I did feel a, a physical paralysis in late winter when we went into lockdown in mid-April of this year. Uh, we had already endured a long winter of inertia and an absence of movement where we had nowhere to go was paralyzing. Uh, my in-person exhibitions continued to be cancelled or moved online and many opportunities for in-person exhibitions disappeared. Um, and personally, I felt divorced from my audience. I think that was the, the most difficult thing and the lack of interaction about what I was making. So my interests in um, an experience with dance and choreography and the lack of social and relational interaction with people and places, I began watching how the performing arts companies moved from the stage to the screen to address their audience in a new way. How gesture, movement, tempo, rhythm, form and space was reconsidered for a digital context. Sight, had to be reimagined and editing and filming became highly significant to presenting and sharing works with the public, whether short or long. <laughs> I began watching um, Ballet Jorgen, uh, who have their headquarters in Toronto but run classes, uh, are very generous in how they run their classes and perform across all the Canadian provinces, um, and they continue to do that online as well. They made short performance videos with site-specific choreography where the dancers were interacting with and animating places and monuments in various cities across the Canada. Um, I really felt that the Ballet Jorgen uh, videos were highly evocative and really masterfully choreographed for the site, uh, for the urban site. And this one, of course, is um, Halifax. Uh, more recently, I've been looking at uh, what's been going on in Europe. The, in particular, I've been struck by the Dresden Frankfurt Dance Company. Um, it, what you're looking at here in this image is Sam Young Wright, who's dancing in front of the European Center for the Arts called Hello, and he's communicating essentially by dancing the announcement of the reopening of the ballet in December 2021. So, of course, I've been thinking uh, about how craft is being consumed and experienced in new ways during the crisis. Um, craft artists, potters, uh, in terms of ceramics, potters and sculptors have been posting videos and reels of their craft processes uh, and techniques on Instagram and YouTube, where they perform these techniques and thus we, under, we are understanding it digitally. Uh, in a new way. Um, it's useful to know how something is made and this performativity within the context of a community certainly is central to new paradigms that have been proposed by American art historian Jenny Sorkin in her publication Live Form, uh, where she rewrites ceramic history, <clears throat> sorry, modern uh, contemporary ceramic history and theory around significant, uh, three significant women artists of the North American studio craft movement. My own uh, clay sculptures and the ones that I'm using for the video are made with my hands without the use of a pottery wheel. I use very few tools, mostly my hands are on the clay and really what is central to my practice is how the forms emerge while I am making. I reject the mind and matter binary so prevalent in theories about art and craft um, in the last century, where it was believed that objects were formed through the imposition of mental realities upon material ones. Uh, when I make my sculptures, I, I very much open myself to the vitality, the material vitality of the clay. I sense its fragility, its strength, its plasticity, which is enormous. And it is these properties that are really give rise to the sculpture forms that I make. And it's really a dance using my hands to make my sculptures and dance with them 
is so empowering and gives me a tremendous feeling uh, personally of agency. What I've just been talking about, um, I did write about in Studio Magazine, uh, in, published in 2018 in an article, Making Material and Orientation. I think that's gonna be put in the uh, chat right now. Um, as well as my colleague who's here today, uh, Lara Kotsuba, uh, recently um, at, in Ceramics Art and Perception has written um, an astoundingly, astoundingly exciting article. I was so excited when I read it. Um, about uh, the re very much about the relevance of movement in my work, uh, about the feminism, um, of course, and uh, the role of motherhood in my work. So my sub subjectivity as a woman artist and feminist is the lens from which I express myself. And my video project draws inspiration and meaning from the sculptures I made in 2018. Uh, which is what you see here on, on the screen. So you're looking at um, three of a larger group of six invisibility cloaks, I call them. They're hollow, they're garment-like forms that evoke the female body. And I think of these very much uh, as works, uh, these works as allegories of female agency and protection. And um, these pieces were precipitated by the social and feminist Me Too movement, uh, which happened, I guess we would say, in 2017, which really grew out of truths about power and violence against women, gender-based violence. Uh, for myself, for my own two daughters, young adults, who specifically are not, are not white, they're colored, um, this wave, this feminist wave brought uh, to light the sexual violence against women, which is really ubiquitous in our patriarchal society and culture. Uh, for so long, women did not feel safe talking publicly about the sexual harassment, assault and rape they have experienced as victims of violent crimes. And as a survivor of sexual assault as a young woman, within the context of the university institution, I was very compelled uh, in my experience of trauma to make these, this series of invisibility cloaks. Uh, they embody, here's a, a close up, a top view of one of them. They embody dy dynamic movement of the female figure through narratives of flight as freedom or protection. And the sculptures very much address personally, uh, my, my life, my family, and uh, the collective. They evoke the female body wrapped in a protective cloak of trees. And in these, I reinterpret the ancient Greek myth of Daphne and Apollo from a feminist perspective. Daphne is a water nymph transformed into a tree by the earth goddess Gaia, who witnesses Apollo attempting to rape, rape Daphne. And through an act of protection, Gaia transforms the water nymph, Daphne, uh, into a tree. And the power of this story in particular really, really resonates with me. Um, and uh, also, I do believe, <laughs> due to my own Greek an ancestry and um, connection to the stories, the ancient stories, uh, and specifically to the place where my grandparents lived in Northern Greece in Thessaly, which uh, happens to be the location of the stream associated with the mythical water nymph of Daphne. Uh, the story, of course, of Apollo and Daphne has been written about and has been a subject for art um, from ancient times in the Western world, of course, um, and here I'm showing you um, an image of Bernini, the Italian Renaissance sculptor and architect uh, depiction of the myth, uh, where rape is depicted as a love pursuit. Um, Gaia is nowhere in sight. And um, the look of curiosity on Apollo's face is um, quite a contrast to what's actually happening. Um, in this transformation, and it was Ovid uh, that wrote about this metamorphosis of 
Daphne into a tree. And um, also in the Renaissance, and I put this up because of course it's ceramics and that's my um, main metier, um, is a plate from the Garden Museum, uh, again of the same story, Apollo and Daphne. Um, Apollo pursuing her on the left, she's beginning to turn into a tree. And there's a number of bystanders, stand, bystanders including Cupid. But again, Gaia is nowhere in sight. Um, and so a part of the series, I also started to begin to work on the Growing Wings, the Wing series. Again, as a, a, an allegory of flight, as freedom. And this, uh, these works, which are what I'm using for the video uh, project, are, are rooted in the ancient Greek source of Nike, um, which has been has different meanings now in our contemporary society, uh, but still within the, the, the context of the patriarchal um, idea of victory. Um, and Nike was the female uh, body, female with wings. This one is uh, from uh, currently in the Louvre, and it's probably the most famous one, the Nike of Samothrace, which was, is it made of marble? and was, uh, I believe, the research shows that it was at the front of a ship, um, a military ship, as a token, uh, a reminder of victory. But of course, I'm using it in a different way. So um, here it are, the, I'm going to show you a, a short video of the Wings series. Uh, which is what I'm using for the, the video project. And um, they do suggest the female body with wings, thinking about flight as a symbol of freedom and empowerment, and very much rooted in uh, feminism. And I'm thinking a lot about the power of transformation as I uh, form the clay with my hands. So I'm just going to play this for you.
So I've been thinking um, and searching for ways to communicate and share these sculptures digitally. Um, I'll make a little correction. What you were just looking at was not a video. <laughs> it was a slideshow of stills. Um, on the one hand, I'm searching for another way for an audience to consume my work. Um, a, ra a static image of only one side of a sculpture is really, really limited uh, way to understand the work based solely on vision and not touch. So I began to animate the works through touch with my own hands. Um, thinking about activating the viewer's mirror neurons where their own brain can recall, well brain, I don't even want to use that word, but where they can recall uh, feelings associated with touching things in um, sensual ways, erotic ways, um, a ceramic bowl that you eat from, a pebble from a beach, granite as you sit on it, sensual erotic touch of another human body, stroking or holding, cradling a baby or an infant, uh, stroking um, a pet, a cat, a dog. I'm thinking about abstraction of a thing that is touched and through a soft and flowing movement quality, the observer can be left to imagine their own metaphors um, and feelings. Um, the viewer really is left to their imagination. So I wanted to touch, trace and retrace the forms and shapes and lines of my own making as a way to articulate and understand the movement and draw attention to the figurative aspects and metaphors of the pieces. And in doing this, I'm really creating a dance through spontaneous movement improvisation. And I arrive at the choreography that way. So it's an empathetic and playful response to my own uh, sculptures that I've made. The craft of ceramics really is universal and collective in its metaphors. And there really are so many figurative metaphors in ceramics. It has the longest history as a material for expression and use that references the human body. Uh, vessels, which have openings and therefore a metaphor for the body. My works are hollow, all of them. Um, they are vessels in a sense um, with an opening. They have insides uh, they, where we can imagine and I can imagine feelings, mysteries, secrets, and other things that we contain, memories. Capacity for the female body to contain another being, of course, and release it and still remain whole as a vessel in that sense through birth um, is one of the things I talk about in these works non-verbally. Um, and the tension, of course, between a hollow and a solid form, uh, that ceramics uh, certainly has that inherent uh, in its um, material for vessel making, its potential for vessel making. Um, and in fact, uh, for the non-ceramics people that are here, I'm sure there are many, um, the language associated with parts of a clay pot are actually anthropomorphic and relate to the body, um, human and animal for that matter. Um, the foot, we refer to the foot of a pot, we refer to the body of a vessel, we refer to the shoulder of a pot, to the neck, and so on. Um, and there are many landscape metaphors um, also that are associated with vessels and ceramics as the inside of a pot as a metaphor for the cosmos, uh, the large curved planes suggesting terrain uh, of, of our lands. Um, and clay really, really so much in my own mind and universally is, uh, has a skin, a vessel as a skin, it's very fleshlight, sensual as a body. And I build my, my, my clay sculptures with walls and thinking of them as a skin as I make it. And uh, probably above all, the indexical nature of clay and the fact that my own body is in the work through the impressions of my hands on the clay um, is, is really important to me. And so that the clay reveals my movements over time through those impressions. So it's a uh, 
time-based and certainly indexable. Um, and an, another thing I think about, and certainly Lara Kotsuba has written about this, is the impressions and asymmetry of uh, the sculptures that I make. Slight asymmetry um, uh, is suggestive of them being touched and being held in those impressions of the place where they, they that I've left for them to be held. And so making craft uh, really much involves movement and the haptic uh, proprioception, our awareness of our position and movement um, of our own bodies uh, when we're relating to them. So the last thing I want to talk about is healing, uh, which is a really uh, significant part of this video project. Um, you know, the inertia um, that comes from violence, shock and trauma, a sort of paralysis, um, I'm really intentionally with these pieces um, thinking about nonviolent touch. So in fact, the opposite, different, uh, me, the, the myriad of different types of touch that are nonviolent and fluid. And I'm very much trying to seek a, a softness and a freedom and joy through playful movement um, as I essentially touch these works. Um, and I'm animating the wings series of sculptures through touch and movement rather than displaying them in a fixed static way. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about and some other uh, colleagues have pointed out is um, the actual practice of healing touch, which is a form of actually intervention, which is actually used in the medical profession, um, which involves healing touch through empathy um, and the practitioner places their hands a lot like Reiki um, on the body of the person that is to be healed. And this can be understood in religious contexts and non-religious contexts. Um, so the movements are really a way uh, to feel the sculptures and for myself to have empathy with their curved undulating forms and evoke associated, sorry, associated emotions um, empathy for myself, of course, as I heal from the trauma of violence. I do communicate to the viewer the nuances of each piece, uh, the exterior forms, the textures, the insides and the outsides, um, and the metaphors and the imagery. That is what I'm intending to do. And there is an agency or power in using my hands to build. Um, and this power feeds my feeling of strength. And for this reason, I reflect back with my own hands and I mirror and re rediscover what I have made. Um, you know, as artists, we, we, we always step back. Um, writers, visual artists, dancers, choreographers. We always step back to study and discover what we have made. And we often do this through our eyes, certainly visual artists. Uh, particularly when we work spontaneously in dialogue with materials. So through touching uh, what I've made, I discover it by feeling it. And the video documentation is a record and an acknowledgement of that. I'm going to just, uh, before I finish off here, just uh, show you some stills uh, again, um, and you can just uh, watch. Okay, um, so I just wanted to finish with um, 
talking about spontaneity and the spontaneous process of art making, I really do um, think is linked to individual liberty. And um, this video, sorry, video project is going to very much rooted in improvisation, allow for freedom of spirit through empathy and play. And uh, through these discourses, I've talked about craft, feminism and healing. Um, I'm continuing to, to think about that as I, as I move uh, closer to the end of the project. So thank you uh, for, for listening and for taking time out of your day uh, to hear about this project. And um, I'm looking forward to talking to you shortly about it with answering and talking about questions you may have. So I'll hand this over to Sheila now. Thanks so much, Kathy. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks for all of that. Um, I just, I wanted to ask a question um, related to um, the slow art movement. I'm not sure if you've heard about that, but um, it's basically like, it's sort of based on, um, I think the premise that um, a static art object that we typically see in an art gallery, like a sculpture or a painting is sort of a, a poor representation of the labor and the thought and the time of the artist, right? It's this sort of um, arbitrary moment in which you, not arbitrary, it's, it's decided by the artist, but it's, it's this time in which you decide to stop and, and a, a piece of, of um, the work and the labor and the thought just, you know, pauses at that moment. And I'm just, um, I'm thinking about the advantage of time-based media, right? The, the like, um, you know, if someone reads a novel, you get, you get several hours of that person's attention. If you watch a film, you get, you get a more, more um, comprehensive investment from the viewer, right? And, and um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm often sort of, um, I've been told I take a long time to go through exhibitions, right? I sort of linger with work for a long time. And I'm just wondering, like, first of all, whether you have any sort of thought about this, that slow, art movement and whether whether your attraction to time-based media and that sort of um documentation of those gestures like whether that's sort of about uh demanding um a bit more time of the viewer like what like what was your like what, what was your rationale for that or how did how did you come yeah, to that absolutely it's thinking i'm thinking about the person who's experiencing the work and giving them more <laughs> Um, about, yeah, the labor, the thinking. Um, I, you know, I, I originally studied dance, which is time-based, it's uh -huh. ephemeral. And um, I actually left pretty quickly from it because I had trouble from the maker perspective, actually, um, with the fact that it was there and then it wasn't. So, mm -hmm. This is something I've thought a lot about, and I moved into the visual arts, which are static, and they're there for, they're there. Um, they can be experienced quickly or shortly, but it's, it's definitely something that's kind of, I circled back to, and I, I do think it's part of the intention, it is part of the intention in, in starting this video project. Um, because I can document it, it can be replayed, replayed, replayed um, over time. And it demands, it's true, it does demand, it's going to be short, it's five minutes, but <laughs> uh, it does demand that attention for that time. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and you're you're like you're brave to show work that's still in development. Like I, I appreciate that aspect of like like ultimately do you see the work like the, the exhibition will be the sculptural works um, in conversation with the video or how will- I, I'm thinking about that. Oh uh, yeah, that's something yeah. I'm, I'm getting clear with um, as I work on these clips, these video clips. Uh, the editor, she's, we're still, we're still just compiling the clips. So, uh, so but I have been thinking about, yeah, it would be um, exciting to have the video playing with the sculptures actually there in that same space and sort of speaking uh, back and forth to each other. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, about time. <laughs> and and do you have a venue yet for the exhibition or? Um, no, I don't. Okay, so you're just working away. I'm okay. Working away. Yeah, it's unusual. I, for years, worked with exhibitions, deadlines. Right now, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's good to know. And, and, um, and the collaborator that you're working with with regard to the video, like, did you say that you've worked with that person? Yes. Or like, like, how would you describe the collaborative process? Like, are, are, you, are you sort of the author and she's helping you? Or is yeah, it I'm, yeah, I'm the author. Yeah, I'm the okay. author for sure. That's clear. Um, so she, and, but she's consulting me uh, with me on um, technical things too, because I really knew the video. Um, right. um, so we're still compiling, like I'm still sending her stuff through Dropbox at, at, at present. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but she, I did work with her many, many years ago and she then moved into film and video editing for the last, whatever, 25 years. So she's pretty skilled and has won awards and so on. So I, I, I I'm really using her. I feel like you're in good hands then. I do feel that way. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So we just have an observation from someone who, who attended, um, Kyle Murphy. He says, I find that six months or a year after I've finished something, I have a new set of eyes for how I perceive it. Does the same occur for you with touching a finished piece that later on there's a different sense to it? Absolutely. <laughs> um, through visual, but through touching, absolutely. And as I said, it's a way, because some of the pieces I showed you that are in, will be in the video uh, were made uh, 2019, so it's been two years. So yes, through touching them and um, studying, you know, studying their forms and their general movements and the subtleties, I, I, I have new ideas, like I have new ideas. It it's, doesn't stop changing actually. <laughs> Uh, I can say that certainly about works I made 30 years ago because I've been working in play uh, for 30 years. So absolutely. And that's what keeps it exciting. Um, yeah. So, so can I ask you a question about scale? Like, mm -hmm. the, I, I feel like I have a better sense now of, of how your the works are getting larger, right? Like think like this is kind of larger than you've worked in the past. And like, they've always been sort of stand-ins for the body, but they seem like they're more close to like human scale now, the, the more mm -hmm. recent are, are not really. Um, I, I mean, I worked with the figure, uh, you know, starting in 1990 in ceramics and they were smaller for sure. Right. Uh, but I have the, the Danad series that I did 10 years ago um, were this size. Okay. They're, yeah, they're very colorful and uh, highly reflective, uh, relating to the female body. But they they were twenty five. I, I always go by inches, right? But uh, they were about twenty five inches. In high. That's a, that's the height of my kiln. Okay. At, um, maximum height I can fire at. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but the 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 sort of the white tone really like it. Oh, it reminds me of both bone and flesh, right? The yeah. fact that there's no color on them, it's like they're very sensual and very you concentrate on the form because of the, the lack of color, I find they're, they're just, they have a different quality. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. I mean, I was definitely, the fact that they're unglazed is significant and that's interesting that they, perce people perceive, you perceive them as uh, more human scale for that reason. Yeah. Um, they're certainly not, uh, <laughs> they're very fragile to touch. So they're not because they're, I mean, they're vitrified. They're, the porcelainous stoneware um, fired to cone six. So they are, they're vitrified, but they're not, you know, you, you know, the way your hand slides across a beautiful glazed ceramic surface is not the way my hand glides across. The, no. <laughs> it, has, it has a certain roughness. So it doesn't have that sensuality. Um, yeah, that you would. With. But it has like a sense of like the messiness of the body. More. Yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the way the 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 way they're built, I leave them very raw. It, like you say, yeah. There's no covering. There's no covering. Yeah, yeah. So there's another um, interesting question from someone, an attendee. It says, "Might you be considering transformation as freedom? It seems that your understanding of the limits." of binary thinking, viewing, would lead to many paths to freedom. Oh, the limits of binary viewing. 
Is that what? She says, might you be considering transformation as freedom? It seems that your understanding of the limits of binary thinking, viewing, would lead you to many paths to, to freedom. Yeah, yeah, I, and I didn't talk about that in this talk. Um, I ha have in my writing um, the, the link that I, of, of my article. Yeah, absolutely. Transformation is a kind of freedom for sure. And for transformation of the self, um, transformation of the self. I'm really, I'm thinking a lot about that, how we change and how we grow and, um, things that are traumatic or difficult and how we can work through them and shift and change. And so that, um, myth, uh, really holds my attention. <laughs> yeah. So there's a question here from someone who knows your work well, from Lara. Lara. I, it says, hi, Kathy, stunning work. Could you speak a bit more about your method of constructing your sculptures and how they relate to movement and the haptic? Right. Um, I uh, hand build. I work with pieces and I work with coils. I roll them out. Um, and I... Well, it's, it, yeah, I didn't talk about that. Actually... Uh, because these do relate to the body, I actually um, put my own body actually in these positions, <laughs> even though some of them are really abstract. I put my own body in the position and I kind of kinesthetically think about what it feels like to be in that position. Um, even though these have wings, I put my arms up. And so when I am building typically with these actually, unlike a lot of my sculptures in the past, these ones, I do build from the bottom up. Um, and I move quite quickly with my hands with that uh, visual, but also that kinesthetic, um, uh, that kinesthetic notion of the position, what it feels like to be in that position. <laughs> That's all I can say. Mm -hmm. um, so movement uh, is kind of key in, in how these are built. Yeah. And I, I la and I don't work now with tools smoothing them out. I think that's pretty obvious. So mm -hmm. the, the tools do not smooth out the surface. I, I leave that uh, impression uh, there. I don't know if that answers your question, Lara. <laughs> <laughs> So I like there's there's lots of people here who've been watching your career for a long time. I, so I think I think we're going to open up the room pretty soon and you can say hi to people and people can ask yeah, questions yeah. of you directly. But just as we're opening up the room, I just I wanted to ask sort of a practical question about the pandemic and your practice. Like basically um, the practical impediments of the of of the pandemic for lots of people like meant that lots of people couldn't go to their studios like, you know, they were just sort of really at a standstill. But because you have your ceramic studio in your home and because you were you found a way to collaborate online with other um, people that were assisting you in this chapter of work, like the only real the only real impediment to, to working during the pandemic um, was the was the like anxiety or the melancholy or the whatever was the, all the feelings that were happening. Like, I, I just think it's interesting that you found a way to just keep to keep working like you 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 if if you paused at all in your practice it was only for a very short period of time which i is is a is a testament to just like problem solving and figuring it out so i guess that's a long compliment but i just i've i've, I've encountered lots of other artists who've just you know not not been able to to find a way to to keep working during this time um lots of have but um you know, everyone's basically trying to figure this out. So, yeah. Like, yeah. So, what do you, what do you, like? Do you have any thought about that, or do you have any like observations from other colleagues, or do you think most people are figuring it out, finding ways? Well, to keep one of the things that is significant for me, uh, first of all, I have the studio at home. That's that's big, but that I have often worked on my done, done my work without um specific places in mind exhibit it like i i so i am used to working in that way like i i, ha I don't I haven't always worked to deadlines to exhibition right. deadlines so that's pretty significant the other thing is i'm no longer teaching so i have well i'm doing a mentorship i'm leading a mentorship now but uh for the last year and a half i haven't been teaching so i haven't um having and i really empathize with the, the 
professors and the teachers. I haven't had to like jump and figure that all out. So I've had time, you know, I've had time. <laughs>